So I first worked as a casting assistant in film and then for commercials. And I've worked as entertainment manager, voiceover artist, script editor, writer, director, just in so many different capacities, having worked with actors. I think I understand how actors are thinking and feeling a lot of the time. Now I know what casting directors expect. I know what performers expect. Are there some specific things that agents look at? Yeah. They might have a perfect profile, they might do the perfect cover letter, and we go, we really like them, but we have someone like them. Yeah, yeah. So, how important is training, and what, like, how do you look at experience and training that your applicants have? Other people really struggle, and they get so in their mind about it that they can't produce a good tape, they can't act, they can't show their acting abilities because they're so stressed about setting up the tape. <laughs> what, are, what are the biggest mistakes that you can see people do on self tapes? Because it's camera, obviously people want to be very natural, which is you know, great. But then they forget to use their voices. If you're made to feel bad for turning something down, that you were clear is not your focus. That's also, I wouldn't say a good thing. Doing their lines like this or turning completely like this. And then I can't connect with your eyes or the emotion in half your face, because I can only see this. What are the most annoying things that actors do? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Andrew Rogozin, and this is Beyond Real Talk, a podcast where I invite real entertainment industry professionals and ask them real questions. What are they actually doing? How are they doing it? Why are they doing it? And how can you start doing the same thing? And my today's guest is lovely Nicole uh, Ricardo. She is uh, my agent, junior agent in Fiona Cross Management. And today we're, we'll talk about everything agent related. And a little bit about music, because I found out <laughs> just recently that Nicole is a musician and singer. Hi, Nicole. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> just a little note, we're recording in the office and the sound here might, we, sometimes you might hear passing cars or you know, ambulance or police. Hopefully they're not coming for us. Just some London ambiance. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day, I'm sure. And let's talk about, well, first of all, you know, let's talk about you being a musician. I didn't uh. know about it. <laughs> How, uh, because I'm guessing that you're working as a, like as an agent. Mm -hmm. uh, you, I thought before that probably you are connected somehow to, to creative, mm -hmm. you know, creative side of life. <laughs> I thought that maybe you're, you're an actor, maybe you're an actress as well, no? I am not an actress. I did study performing arts. Mm. So back in the day, I'm a bit older than I look, I think. <laughs> um, I will not ask because <laughs> I'm, I'm a gentleman. I'm a gentleman. <laughs> um, I did study performing arts, so musical theatre, acting, a little bit of dancing. Um, really got involved in every sort of area, writing, directing, everything I could. But I've always been surrounded by music. I've always loved music. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm from South Africa. so. The industry is much Another smaller there. <laughs> the industry is a lot smaller there. And I think when I moved to London, there was just much more of a platform for me to explore the music side of things. How long and ago did you move? In 2020, in oh. the middle of lockdown. <laughs> uh, well, in the middle of lockdown, I was spending my time in, in my room getting fat and miserable. <laughs> <laughs> and I was moving countries, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, but yeah, there's just an incredible sort of um, community for people who love music in London. So it really gave me the opportunity to explore that more and bring out that side of myself. And I think I connected with that a lot more when I was studying performing arts. I enjoyed acting. I enjoyed all the different aspects of it, but it wasn't necessarily what I was meant to do for the rest of my life. Whereas coming here, working in the agency, working in casting mm -hmm. and doing music, that feels a lot truer to who I am at the core mm -hmm. and I think you know going through your 20s early 30s is all about discovering that about yourself so yeah. Yeah. I mean I'm in my <laughs> just beginning, beginning 40s and I'm mm -hmm. still trying to discover well, there you go <laughs> maybe in 20 years time you'll interview me again and I'll still be saying that so <laughs> all right so and uh, so so you moved here how, how quickly did you find people who you can play with here I mean like play 
music. <laughs> can, can I play with you? <laughs> um, well, because it was locked down, there mm-hmm. was nothing going on for a while. Um, but, you know, you make friends, you have common interests, and that person says, oh, I heard about this, let me introduce you mm-hmm. to that, and it, everything just starts connecting. And I think because a lot of like-minded people move, move to London, a lot of creatives move to London, if you're just willing to put yourself out there and meet people and chat, things can often just flow naturally. So that's kind of what happened. And then I specifically went to this one venue where I started spending a lot of time and there was a really great community there. And then I ended up at other venues that were similar and then just meeting a lot of people and one thing led to another. Mm. I mean, I can talk about it for ages. So it's I just, don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> so you know what? This is a podcast about people in the industry. And, you know, you're Fair not enough. just an agent. You're also a creative. <laughs> Most of all, probably you're a creative. Yeah, so we can yeah, talk yeah. about okay, what kind of music do you play? Um, I love blues, rock, soul, uh, anything kind of along those lines, uh, a little bit jazz, a little bit of country. The music that I'm writing myself is very much influenced by blues and rock, but I think it tends to be a bit folkier. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, anything's in that spectrum. When and where can we see you play? <laughs> I don't think this episode will be out before then, but I do have a, a gig this Saturday at the Troubadour. Okay, and like that, that's the closest gig and then you don't know anything. Uh, yeah, I gigs. mean, I often sing at Ain't Nothing But The Blues Bar in Kingley, on Kingley Street in Soho. Mm-hmm. Um, that just depends kind of from week to week. And Nice, so yeah. check it out. I probably at some point I will, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> All right, let's jump to your, you know, agent side. Yeah. How did you become an agent? So I first worked as a casting assistant in film and then for commercials. And I found I really enjoy that. But specifically agency work, it was just a great way for me to bring all my previous skills and experience together because having studied as a performer, having worked as a performer before going into casting, and I've worked as entertainment manager, voiceover artist, script editor, writer, director, just in so many different capacities, having worked with actors. I think I understand how actors are thinking and feeling a lot of the time. I know what it's like to go to an audition and need help with that or have doubts. I know what it's like to have an agent and what you'd want out of an agent. I know what it's like to work in casting and be on the other side of things. Even now, as I've uh, worked for Fiona, I've continued casting on the side, worked on my own short film project. So I know what it's like to see things from that point of view. And I think it was just a good way to bring all my skills and experience together because now I know what casting directors expect. I know what performers expect. Look, I wanted to ask you because I'm, I'm not sure about other actors, but I myself, I do kind of formally know what you're doing because you're Mm -hmm. like, as an agent, you represent actors, you kind of like, you apply as for roles, et cetera, Mm -hmm. et cetera. But can you describe your day and how it happens? Like how you work with spotlights, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so from day to day, uh, personally, when I come into the office, first thing is making sure that tapes meet their deadlines. So confirming with the actors that they've sent off tapes that are due or sending through tapes ourselves that we are sending, uh, reviewing tapes, making sure actors have feedback on anything they might need to redo. Uh, Obviously, the inbox will be full of information on, you know, things that our clients are on set for or on tour for. So making sure everyone has the information they need, replying to production, to casting directors, processing tape requests, processing meeting requests, basically making sure everyone has the information they need. Um, Responding to clients who have questions about anything about their jobs, about their submissions, about their headshots, um, booking in meetings all that kind of stuff. So it can vary from day to day, but obviously prioritizing what what is urgent, what needs to meet a deadline now um, versus, you know, what can be addressed later, uh, but also making sure everything gets covered. (laughs) In the broader picture, agents will do everything. Well, I can only really speak for how Fiona and I work, but everything from recruiting or going through applications. So looking through who's applied or going to graduate shows and seeing who's entering the industry to then having meetings with people who we think could fit on the books. Um, So then using all that information to decide 
whether to offer representation mm. or not, if they accept, you know, going through everything from A to Z with them, what, what kind of work do you want to do? What kind of work don't you want to do? Where do you see yourself in the industry? Do we think that's realistic? How can we support you in that? Getting to know everyone as well as possible, basically. What are your skills? What are your, what is your training? What is your family like? You know, sometimes mm. that comes into commercials and all that kind of stuff. Um, storing all the information, processing all that information. Ideally, they'd have Spotlight. So we're looking at briefs. Every day, the briefs the casting directors are putting out on Spotlight. We're reading those briefs. We're then cross-referencing. So briefs will have very specific details. So must how, how does that work? So just uh, like on, on, the, on the point of Spotlight, how does it work? Like, do you... Do you receive uh, some messages directly from casting directors or are they just putting out like some, some kind of castings with some criteria and you have to go through all of them? Yeah. So on Spotlight, casting directors can choose to put their briefs out only to agents or to agents who are on their lists because they can create their own lists or to agents and actors who are unrepresented. So it's really up to the casting directors mm -hmm. uh, who they want to put their briefs out to. And it's up to agents to have relationships with the casting directors who choose to work from specific lists. Um, so we will be seeing, like Fiona and I will be seeing briefs from all the casting directors that we've specifically reached out to, to be on their lists. We'll be seeing briefs from agents who've put out their briefs to all agents, uh, casting directors who've put out their briefs to all agents. Um, and then we'll be reading those. So it will say must be available this and this and this must be this age this ethnicity speak these languages based here all these different things that come into uh, that we need to take into account and then we go okay this person could be suitable so we'll sub you know we'll submit them but first cross reference with their calendar so we'll store all the client's information uh, on on tagman or whatever system you know yeah. an agent is using cross reference their calendars um, also, we need to know them as well as possible. So if we're like looking for someone who you can sing in this range, for example, I need to know the musical theatre performers very well. I need to know what their voices sound like, what their capabilities are, so that I can make sure they match that description. So we're cross-referencing everything and then submitting the people who are absolutely right for it. How many how many applications like that you receive on average on a day? How many you need to go through? <laughs> it really varies from from day to day, but enough for your head to spin for sure um yeah and then i've lost my train of thought now oh, sorry. no that's fine it, I mean, it happens all the time um sometimes if there's something very specific we might do an extra push so on spotlight you i don't know if you know this or not but we can choose which headshot of yours to use for the application mm. so if you have one smiling one and one serious one and this character is a friendly character we mm. use a smiling one and we can add little notes so if they say must be able to speak russian um, and be of russian heritage then if i'm submitting you for example i can use a smiley headshot and then i can say is actually latvian but speaks russian fluently and then they know and they can mm. consider that before they call you in um and then if it was something where they were like we're looking for someone who has their own podcast. <laughs> then I could also never happens. <laughs> <laughs> then I could also, you know, send depending on whether the casting director is open to receiving it or not. They'd usually say in the brief they'd either make their contact details available or not, or say please don't, you know, email us or please don't call us or please do email us or whatever it is. Uh, we might send an extra push saying hey, here's Andre, he runs his own podcast, he has this and this experience, he speaks these languages. We just wanted to flag him because we think he's ideal for the job. So that's sort of the the application process. Yeah. Sometimes it might involve having calls. Um, I had a musical theatre casting director call me the other day, talk to me for about 20 minutes because the role was so specific, what he was looking for, and he was like, you know, you know your client, can, yeah. they, can they fit this type of thing? <laughs> Um, tape requests, meeting requests will then come in with all the information. So we'll obviously process that on the client's calendars. We will speak to the client. So, you know, if I send you a request, I'll usually also text you and say, hey, yeah. please, please read this. Please confirm. Make sure you're happy with all the details. 
Um, sometimes there's something very specific. Maybe you need to be comfortable with sitting in water for an hour or something. So I might need to call you or text you and ask you if you're okay with that. Um, if offers come in, we'll call, we'll say, you know, congratulations, you've been offered the job, here are the details. Mm -hmm. And then it's all the production information. So making sure production has your measurements, your address, um, you know, any any information they need. It's then reading the contracts, making sure the contracts are correct, that they're in line with, you know, industry standards, in line with equity. We might negotiate. So you also have to have this, that kind of knowledge as well. <laughs> yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> and, and I mean, sometimes it's a matter of, obviously making sure we're well informed or up to date with what the industry standards are, what equity is, but sometimes we're also learning on the job. So Fiona and I, well, Fiona Cross belongs to the PMA. So it's a, an association that regulates sort of how agencies work. Mm. So within that, we can speak to other, other agents and say, what is your experience with this and sort of help support each other. Uh, we can obviously speak to equity, e equity, <laughs> we can speak to equity um, and yeah, just make sure that that we are keeping ourselves up to date with all that kind of mm. stuff. Um, so negotiating contracts, if we say absolutely not, that is not enough money or, you know, our clients should really have that transport covered or whatever it is. We will negotiate that with production. Sometimes your clients will have special needs, whether it's dietary requirements, whether it's neurodivergency that has specific requirements, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. We're communicating that, making sure everything from A to Z is sorted then in terms of the job. And then, and of there's course... there's just two of you, right? Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's just two of us. Um, and then making sure you get paid. So chasing payments, processing those payments... Um, and then making sure that things are aired correctly. So, for example, there have been cases where you get paid for your image to be used for a year within a specific region. And then someone is in Spain and is like, hey, my face is on a billboard in Spain and it's two years later. And then we're on, on the phone or on emails to production like, hey, you are a client money because you're still using their image. Um, and other times it's fun things like posters to promote the film or the trailers out for the next film that's in cinema or whatever. Mm. And that's a lot of fun and attending shows, you know, going to the national um, press night, going to the previews of a film of a client that's coming out. You know, there are they are rewarding mm. bits of, of really just getting to then share those moments with our clients once they've uh, landed the jobs are, and are in the midst of them and the whole promotion and everything. So that's pretty exciting. Mm. And then making sure that we use that to help push them for the next job. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I've probably only covered a quarter of it now. <laughs> so. yeah, really? <laughs> I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm not sure how, like, do you, like, do you have the same amount of hours in a day? <laughs> Sometimes do. it doesn't feel like it, yeah. honestly, but we, we, we may sure that what needs to be covered is covered and try to keep our sanity that's that's, that's <laughs> insane because like all this stuff that you kind of, for me when you were kind of going through all the stuff that you're doing for me it felt like it should be five people at least yeah <laughs> yeah but look also we are a boutique agency which means we try to make sure each person has their own place on the books and if we have more if we have, let's say, two people of a similar skill set or look, it's because they're two people who are often working. So while one is working, mm -hmm. we can put the other one up. Um, that being said, it's from the age of three to, you know, almost 80. And then within that, everyone has a different skill set, a different um, ethnicity, a different sort of background might be Spanish, might be English, might be Norwegian, whatever it is. Then some people sing, some people just want to do screens. So when you break it down, it's only a handful of people in each category. And you really need that to keep an agency running mm. because we can't, you can't have an agency running realistically without enough people to keep the of agency course. running. Yeah. Um, so I do think, you know, as any agency grows, you would then get more people on board. But at the moment, Fiona and I have very specifically split our duties and we support each other and we cover each other. And we make sure that everyone gets the attention they need. Um, 
and yeah we mm. <laughs> we survive <laughs> but yes hopefully hopefully we'll get to a point where we do get then mm. three four five people mm-hmm. uh, how often do writers uh writers how often do actors uh send you emails about representation oh every All day time, yeah. every day but we have a separate uh inbox for that mm-hmm. <laughs> And then, you know, every now and then I will I will go through that and really only look at, at people who are different to who we have on the books, mm-hmm. who are filling a slot that, you know, doesn't clash with the... Cl- I mean, we receive applications from really lovely actors who are very strong, but we just can't, mm. you know, realistically, we can't take them. Uh, is, is it the case mostly for, like, for most agencies or only for, like, smaller boutique agencies that uh, they try not to take on uh, actors who are, like, the, the, the same type that already have? Um, it depends on the agency. I think definitely more for boutique agencies. Bigger agencies who, uh, let's say, are doing a lot more commercials and just pushing, because we work across the board, but you get agencies that are very like specifically focused on one type of thing, maybe supporting a lot of day players or a lot of commercials, mm-hmm. whatever it is. They might have multiple, but each to his own. You know, I, Again, I can only speak for how Fiona and I yeah. operate. Other agents might have a different um, mindset or specialty or way that they view mm-hmm. it. So maybe it would be good advice for uh, actors who want like to, to kind of find a new agent or switch mm. an, like, an agent. Mm. Maybe do some research. Let like look at at the books. See if there is anyone you're like in your casting type, mm. and maybe there is way less mm. chance that you would be mm. accepted, right? But it's also it's interesting because from a casting side, <laughs> I've seen agencies that that are specific. So for example, they only represent people who maybe have a different look. So people who are heavily tattooed and have piercings and like unconventional hairstyles, for example. So everyone in their books has tattoos, mm-hmm. piercings, funky hair, blah, blah, blah. So if you are someone who looks that way, that's maybe a good way to go because they're specifically sourcing that type. You get agencies who specifically source people who have special action training, who are stunt doubles, who, you know, can do fire breathing or have very sort of specific skills and they're sourcing them for just that Mm -hmm. all the time. Um, Not necessarily then for sort of heavy acting roles, but, you know, sourcing all the sort of fantasy productions and things for Netflix. So it's about finding what's right for you. Whereas, for example, Fiona and I, we don't have anyone on the books at the moment who, let's say, has face tattoos. So if someone applied who had face tattoos, we might go, okay, we don't have anyone like that yet. You know, let's let's consider this person. Let's have a chat with them. I'm just using it as an example. Um, so they can decide to go that route of going for the agency who specifically yeah. goes for people like that or going for an agency who hasn't got anyone like that. And why not try both, depending on, on what you want to do as an actor? Mm-hmm. What would be just in general your advice for actors who look for representation uh are there some specific things that agents look at uh when someone applies yeah i think again there's two ways to answer this question one sometimes it's nothing to do with you and it's nothing personal it's just about them not having space Mm -hmm. at that point in time um but i would say just always make sure your uh, CV and your spotlight is in the best shape it can be. So headshots that show what you look like in real life, what you would look like when you show up to your auditions, when you show up to your meeting, that really represent a true reflection of you and the characters you could play. Um, you know, a strong show reel that, that we can see you playing the kinds of characters you want to play. Um, if you are someone who speaks different languages or is really into voice work that has all the voice clips there, all that kind of stuff, just making it clear what you have to offer. Mm-hmm. And your cover letter giving us an idea of who you are, in short, what you would like to achieve. Define short. In short. <laughs> and what you expect of an agency, in short. So I say in short, Two to three sentences of each. Mm-hmm. Hey, this is who I am. This is what I have to offer or what sets me apart. If you want to add, this is some of my training. Um, 
this is what I would like to achieve out of my career and this is what I expect out of an agent. Immediately we can then go, okay, this is someone worth meeting or we wouldn't be the best fit for them. Um, but then again, that they might do that per they might have a perfect profile, they might do the perfect cover letter and we go, we really like them, but we have someone like them yeah, already. Yeah. So how important is training and what like how do you look at experience and training that your applicants have? The most important part is seeing that the performer can perform, mm -hmm. has something to offer, has something that pulls you in and that really reads well. So if I'm going to watch a show that someone's in and they pull my attention mm -hmm. and are a great actor at face value, my first question to them is not going to be, did you study? What mm -hmm. training do you have? Um, the same thing if I'm watching a good show reel, whether I'm casting or, or looking at an agency application, if I can see from that show reel that they're a really good actor, either they're really natural or they fit a character, whatever it is, that's all I need to know. Having good training obviously is important. I think it comes into play a lot for jobs that require a lot of, um, what's the word? You know, you need to be consistent over a long period of time. Yeah. So let's say you're going to be in a TV series that runs a couple seasons. Like training prepares you for learning lines overnight. Training prepares you for getting onto set and being ready to go and dealing with, you know, all the different sides of it. If you've, I think especially for stage, if you want to be in theater, you have to deliver every single night. You have to deliver an excellent performance. There's, you know, you can't be low energy one night and high energy the next. You have to be consistent. Or know how to use it at least. Exactly. And it, it takes, it takes training to build up stamina. It's like going to the gym and, and working your muscles. If mm -hmm. you want, if you want to jog a 10 K, you have to train. And so I think that really comes into play for jobs that are sort of longer term. But if you're going to be on set for a commercial for one day or you're going to play a day player role that really just fits into what your personality mm. is like, I don't I don't think they're even going to look at whether or not you studied or where you studied. Mm -hmm. um, so it depends on the job. And I think also when recruiting this specific drama school specific theater schools that we know, oh, if they went there, they've they've got a certain standard of training. So, yes, it gives you that stamp of like. They should be reliable. They should be consistent. But everyone is different. Mm. So you only learn that by trial and error. We only learn that by having meetings with the person, deciding to take them on, and then seeing how that relationship goes. Um, so yes, it, it plays a role, but I, it's never going to be the deciding factor. Is there some kind of a requirements for self-tapes? And uh, I'll clarify why I'm asking, because there are companies who just produce self-tapes for actors, mm, right? Mm. Is it worth to go there? It's going to depend on your personal circumstances. So some people have a great setup at home. They have a ring light or natural light through a window. They have a blank wall. They have a good sound. They have a partner or a flatmate who can read in for them. And they're able to produce really good quality self-tapes from home. Some people, unfortunately, don't have that. You know, they have a tiny room in a flat where the flatmates are loud and there's not, you know, no natural lighting or and perhaps can't afford to to buy a proper like ring light or whatever it is. And so then deciding, okay, this is a much bigger job. I'm going to go to a studio and have them tape it for me is maybe worth it on occasion. But if you are able to produce a good quality cell tape from home, then that's fine. And then the personality aspect comes in. Sometimes you're someone who is quite good at, you know, you can place cameras and you can look back and you can say, oh, I need to do that again. I need to change my eye line and be your own sort of feedback. Other people really struggle and they get so in their mind about it that they can't produce a good tape. They can't act. They can't show their acting abilities because they're so stressed about setting up the tape. Again, I think it's worth reducing that stress and having someone else do it for you mm -hmm. if you know that it's just going to stress you out and you're not going to be able to deliver your best performance. Your age, well, your agent, I say your agent, <laughs> 
Fiona and I specifically like to review tapes so we can give that feedback. We can say, you know what, next time, see if you can get some better lighting on you from the front. Maybe if you do this, you tweak that. We like to um, organize workshops where our clients can then ask casting directors questions and and learn from them. Like even even little things about eyeline. Um, there's so many things that can just help, tiny things that can help make it a self tape better that you can learn yourself mm. and apply yourself or you know i'm not the kind of person that's just going to stress me to think about all these mm. things and then you rather get someone external so i would say it just depends on you um and you know not everyone is in a position to spend that kind of money so then it's about linking up with other people so maybe someone else in the agency or another friend who's an actor um is really great at doing their self tapes so you say hey i'll read in lines for your next tape or if you are a great yoga teacher or accent coach like i'll give you an accent lesson or a yoga lesson if you can please help me Mm. tape this and you know hopefully sort of trade skills amongst each other for people who really cannot afford to to go to the studios but Mm. if you can you know make use of it you know that's I don't see why not. Um, tapes are tough because it's so easy to disconnect. But also there's small, easy things you can do to make yourself um, approachable or, or make it easy to connect on camera. So I know it's it's tough. <laughs> what, are, what are the biggest mistakes that you can see people do on self-tapes? Okay, pet peeve of mine is because it's camera, obviously people want to be very natural, which is, you know, great, but then forget to use their voices. So the voice isn't present and there is a there's less um thought putting put into diction and pronunciation. So I'm watching the tape and I'm like, what like I can't hear what you're saying. Um and yeah, I think people tend to think because it's camera and they want to be more natural, they don't think about that. But when I'm watching the tape, I still need to hear what you're saying. Mm-hmm. I still need to connect with your voice. I still need to know that your voice can be present. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is eye line. So everyone tells you don't look directly at the camera, but then you get people doing their lines like this or turning completely like this. And then I can't connect with your eyes or the emotion in half your face because I can only see this. Or you've gone, hey, to, you know, because someone's spoken to you off camera. Um, we never want to disconnect with, with your face, even though you're not looking directly at the camera. So a useful trick we actually, um, someone did at a workshop recently with a casting director that we organized is that it's just the eye line. So if someone else, you're, you're still kind of, dead on but you're speaking to someone else and your eye line is there and if if i'm doing my monologue here and suddenly someone speaks to me from there i'm just going but i'm not going mm-hmm. like this because the moment i've you've i've done this i'm losing your voice i'm losing the emotion in your face i'm losing the connection with your eyes mm-hmm. so yeah I, I hope that answers your question yeah yeah so so voice eye lines uh Figuring out where the people are or that you talk to. So, for example, mm-hmm. there's one like on this side of, of, of a lens, mm-hmm. one's here, like, and you don't, but you don't look at the lens as well. <laughs> yeah. And then I think being uh, actors get afraid to use their bodies when mm-hmm. they're on tape because they now need to fit into a frame. So it's like this. But there's so much expression that goes on in your physicality. <sighs> you know, just w- even, it, you know, your character suddenly tired. Just a little slump in the shoulders, or it's a very commanding. You're playing, you know, an FBI agent or mm. a bodyguard or whatever. Just having that confidence in the shoulders, the little bit of physicality you can put into that frame, like really relaxing into whatever it is, mm. um, rather than feeling like a doll that's stuck on the spot. So you know, don't be afraid to use the little lean forward, the little lean back. Um, well, another thing that like it's just. It's hard to decide sometimes actions. Not all actions that are written in the script yeah. you can do on something. Yeah. 
<laughs> how much of the action you want how creative actors can be with self tapes are there some kind of rules mm. like you never break this rule mm. or or no like there are some rules like if you break the rule they're like oh actually this is so mm. this much better it really depends on the job and the role so i've seen <laughs> commercial castings where they're like then you need to be jumping over the couch and dancing across the living room and sweeping the kitchen floor whilst singing and spitting on your head or whatever you know <laughs> and and some people would would literally if they have if they can if yeah. they have the facilities to do so would form themselves jumping across yeah. the couch and dancing across the living room um and then other people don't have the facilities for that so they will create a space with a camera and then you know mime the actions as best as they can within that space so it's just about adjusting it to make it work for what you are able to do mm. um and giving whatever you can make work giving that your all and i think for film and tv only go out of your way to perform that action like physically if it so really serves the story um if they've said specifically we need to see you kick a soccer ball mm. for example a, a football mm. yeah. <laughs> sorry i'm not from the uk i say soccer um uh, or, podcast is over <laughs> <laughs> um but you know sometimes it'll be like action reads pet their dog and it sounds like but i don't have a dog to pet and i'm like mm. it's fine just mm. pretend you're petting a dog <laughs> you know um and then other people have an adorable dog and I'm like please put your dog in a tape. <laughs> Can the dog take too much attention from the actual actor? <laughs> It is a silly example, but yeah, I think it's just about taking it case by case and hopefully you'd have the kind of agent who if you're unsure can give you that feedback. Mm. So if you're really in two minds about it and it's stressing you out, then you just say, "Hey, I don't know what to do about the script. Mm -hmm. This is what I have access to. These are my facilities. What do you think I should do? And then, you know, your agent can say, just do it on the spot and mind the yeah. actions. I think that's fine. And you know, or say, I think it would be great if you actually spin on your head so that we can see you can spin on your head. <laughs> Just for fun. <laughs> Just for fun. Like because because I I would like to see that. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a long day. We're tired. Just please come on. <laughs> come on. Uh, how important is the quality of the tape? I mean, for self tape, because I know that some people put so much effort. Mm. It's almost like full production, mm. and some people only can do decent, uh, decent lighting, decent sound. But it's a phone. It's a white wall. Yeah. Like, does it? make a difference if you go full way and do i don't know like almost like a full production <laughs> look a full production tape is always going to leave an impression but at the end of the day you can do a full production tape and we can still not connect with you if that's not where your focus has mm -hmm. been because at the end of the day it boils down to if you can deliver that character or not if you're going to be a good actor or not mm -hmm. um or you're just not right for the role once you know once we see you on camera type of thing hopefully if they're calling you and you're somewhat right for the role but then just someone else hit it out of the park or whatever so you can go full scale and still not get the job but it certainly creates an impression you know if if it's you are able to put that kind of quality but i don't think anyone is at a disadvantage if they are not able to deliver that kind of tape mm -hmm. Again, just reiterating, good sound, good lighting, good framing, and just those little tricks of eye line and you know, and and then the most important part being your delivery of whatever your character, you know. Um because I've seen some bad quality tapes um where the acting is brilliant. And in those rare cases, you might be like, mm, I want to see more from this mm -hmm. person, even though their tape wasn't great. But then I've also see, seen some bad quality tapes where I'm like, I just can't connect with this person because of how bad quality the tape mm -hmm. is. And it has occurred once or twice, luckily not very often with our agency where there is a tape that's just really bad quality. And then we say, we actually can't send this to casting because it does not create a good impression of the agency. And in that case, that's when we'd give our client feedback and say, look, 
you know, you really need to focus on this aspect or that aspect when taping. But if you have a low budget, good quality self tape, you've set it up at home, good lighting, good sound, clear delivery, it's not going to fall behind in comparison to mm. someone who's then sat and edited for hours. Uh, if you, uh, well, two questions probably about this one. So for example, uh, I have a friend who I almost always record my tapes with, mm -hmm. but sometimes there are, there are like, there are cases when you can't find no one and you have to record yourself. Mm -hmm. Does it really, is it bad when you have to read the other lines and like basically record your own voice as a reader? No, I don't. I don't find it that much different if I'm watching a tape where it's your own, you've recorded your lines or there's an actual reader. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it can only help you to feed off the energy of your reader if they are also an actor and they deliver their lines well. But you reading in your own lines recorded is also fine because it's still giving you those cues and at the end of the day, we're focused on you. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it ben it doesn't make a difference to the cast and director. It just benefits the actor more, mm -hmm. helps them with their delivery if they can have something to feed off of. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes, depending on who your reader is, you might feed that you feed better off your own recordings because <laughs> because you've you know decided how you want to sort of yeah um, you want the arc of the scene to go, so you know how you're going to read those lines mm -hmm. in. So, all right. Uh, and with the actors' showreels, mm -hmm. uh, for example, well, obviously, if you've been into some production and if you, you have like, some professional good footage like you, it's better to use it if it's good acting, <laughs> ideally. <laughs> uh, but for the actors who don't have enough experience of actually mm -hmm. working on productions mm -hmm. and they have to create some footage, like take some footage for self-tapes, uh, for, for uh, showreel, mm -hmm. Is it worth to go to companies who will do it, do like the scenes for mm -hmm. you? Or is it better to do it at home again with yeah. good, good light, good sound on yeah. your phone, quality is good enough with a friend? Again, depends on your circumstances. So if you can afford to have a professional showreel filmed and you have actors available to you who are good <laughs> yeah. um, and who are willing to be in those scenes with you, then absolutely go for it. But just make sure you are the main focus of those scenes and that mm -hmm. your good actor friend is not overshadowing you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you want them to be good, but you don't want them to do steal that attention <laughs> from you. Um, yeah, then absolutely, you know, why not? Why not go for that? But not everyone can afford that. Um, in that case, I'd say if you want to collect professional looking footage, get involved in a few short films if you have the time to. Obviously, ones that are worth your time where you, you have lines, you have on screen time. And, you know, after you've done three or four, that's enough to put a showreel together, mm -hmm. just making sure that that production team is willing to share that footage with you for your showreel. Um, and if you are not able to do either of those things, then um, a, just a good quality self tape of your own repertoire. So if you really enjoy Shakespeare and you have a good Shakespeare monologue, so good quality self tape of that monologue by itself, clearly labeled. Um, then if you have a contemporary, you know, duologue of something that's on Netflix, you get someone to read in for you, then you do that scene as a good quality self tape. I'd rather see for good good <laughs> for good quality um scenes filmed as self tapes than a low quality show reel that because sometimes <laughs> people tend to go for the cheaper uh show reel options or they try to film it as if it's a short film or something with friends and then it turns out being like just, I don't know what, I want to say like gray. I don't know if that's, mm. if yeah, that makes sense, yeah. you know? Yeah, okay. I can understand what you mean. Like It's just not showing you in your yeah. best light. I'd say 
choose good quality self tape or good quality reel. Mm -hmm. Don't don't go for uh, don't compromise and go for a low quality mm -hmm. reel or try and stage a full production at home mm -hmm. with your friends. Mm -hmm. Mm. <laughs> no, I mean maybe that. try it, but it, you, the, there's no guarantee anything will come out good out of it. <laughs> because, no, because try to like... try do things for sure, <laughs> but don't yeah. expect it necessarily be good. <laughs> That's true. No, you know what? You're you're right. Or give it a go, but <laughs> we the most important thing is that we can connect with you through it. Mm -hmm. So if we're not connecting with you through your show reel or through your monologues that are on there then it's not good mm -hmm. even if your acting is brilliant if we can't connect with you that that's the end of it really so that's the most important part makes sense yeah makes makes total sense um what are the most annoying things that actors do <laughs> <laughs> come on uh because maybe I do something like that. I'm mm. sure I have some annoying habits. <laughs> so maybe I should know about it. <laughs> um. <laughs> Not keeping the calendar for sure is one of those. No, you know what? It's, what I'm going to say is one of those things where it's annoying, but it's not. We're never mad at anyone because we know how things go. But a lot of the time, um, you know, we'll send out information and the information is not read correctly or paid attention to properly. And then we'll immediately get a whole load of questions back for something that just needed to be read correctly. Um, Guilty. So, so that can be frustrating. Um, but also, you know, some we're all human. Sometimes you just miss something, or sometimes you don't understand something. You just need someone else to look at it from a different perspective, or whatever it is. Mm. So it's, it's like that's why I say it's annoying, but it's not annoying. It's it's part of the job to to give that feedback, and we're not actually annoyed with our clients, which is like, I sh that's why I shouldn't say it. Mm. But but if it can be avoided, mm. <laughs> definitely, um, because we are trying to provide the information. But I mean, also we're human, so sometimes. That information maybe is missing, mm -hmm. um, either because we've accidentally left it out or because we actually didn't receive it. And then we can just go, yeah, cool. You know what? Let me ask the casting director. So, <laughs> not being punctual. <laughs> yeah, no. You know what? There's so many circumstances that that contribute to those co kinds of things. Like, I I don't believe that any actor is trying to not meet a deadline, mm. for example. You know, they're all doing their best in their crazy lives, as Fiona and I are too. So I think it comes down to communication. Mm. It's never annoying for someone to... If someone hasn't met a deadline, if they've communicated with us and we know why and we know how to support them or if they can let us know ahead of time so we can support them if you know sometimes it is just a thing of suddenly they have a work meeting and they can't submit a tape and we can help them do that or you know they have to be up really late at night and who's going to read in lines and we can try and link them up with an actor who can read in lines all those kinds of things if it's communicated with us we can support mm -hmm. What is frustrating is if afterwards the actor says, oh, sorry, I, I couldn't tape. I had no one to read in lines and they had a week to do the tape. And then you're like, OK, you know, that happens. You don't always have someone who can read in lines. But if you had communicated with us, I think I touched the microphone. Yeah, sorry. If you had communicated that with us, we could have helped, you know, or whatever, it, whatever is going on, you know. Oh, sorry, I've I've been out of the country for a week. And you're like, well. If you had told us you were out of the country for a week, mm -hmm. then we could have communicated that with the casting director. But now we have to go back to a casting director and say, actually, we didn't know our actor was away, mm -hmm. which reflects poorly on the agency as well as the actor. Mm -hmm. So communication, that's what it will always boils down to. People are human. People make mistakes. People go through tough times. As long as they're communicating with us, we completely understanding of all of those things. It's when the communication is lacking that, mm -hmm. that I think that's the most annoying thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's never in a malicious way. It's always in a way of us wanting to be able to help. 
Okay, so communicate. Yeah. <laughs> to everyone. <laughs> Not just your Asian, just in general. Come on, it's a good girl. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, is there such a thing as a blacklist of factors that no agencies will touch with it? You know, with a stick. I, I mean, I've not come across it in such a severe <laughs> term, but at the, at, there is sometimes, you know, one or two people who've maybe just been really disrespectful mm. to their agent or jumped from one to another in, in a quite unprofessional way. And then agents would communicate amongst mm. each other and say, you know, did you receive this application? Mm. Did you hear about what that person did? Um, I mean, I don't personally have a list of people I blacklisted, but you do sometimes come across the craziest applications or sort of attitudes from mm. actors. And then people go, yeah, you know, been there, right? <laughs> Mm. avoid type mm -hmm. of thing mm -hmm. but i do think on a smaller scale actors are learning as they go mm -hmm. so they should be allowed second chances yeah um and also you know agents aren't perfect either so maybe there was a situation previously where the agent was out of line or their dynamic together just didn't work so that actor should have the opportunity to to have a good dynamic with a different agent and not just go off of what you know, one previous agent mm -hmm. has told them. So, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a specific blacklist, but <laughs> no, such a shame. <laughs> there are sometimes murmurs. <laughs> are there any kind of red flags mm. that actors should look at as well? Mm. Because there are like faulty yeah. agents, right? Mm. Well, I would say first of all, having an agent who's willing to communicate with you. So, if you came to your agent with doubts concerns whether personal whether about the work whatever it is if they're not willing to have that conversation with you or you know shrug it off or make you feel bad in that interaction mm -hmm. then it's probably not the best dynamic um i would say in that sense also actors should keep in mind that agents are usually very busy and also have a lot going on in their own lives so a short reply to something isn't necessarily a shove off or anything. Um, but yeah, then, you know, if, if the client were to reach out and say, well, let's, let's have a chat. Can I call you? Can we set up a meeting? Sometimes, for example, myself, I'll say, I can't talk right now, but I'll try and call you later or let's book in a slot for, for in two days time, we can do a zoom call, whatever it all come to the office. We'll have a coffee. Um, if, if that's the kind of relationship you would like to have with your agent and you're not able to, then you're probably with the wrong agent. An agent who is not asking, like say for example, you turn down a few tapes for some reason and the agent is not asking you, is there a circumstance we should be aware of that, you know, is there a reason that you're turning down these tapes? Either for example, maybe, you know, it's McDonald's tape and you turn it down and I don't know why you've turned it down. It might just be that you're vegan and mm -hmm. I need to know that you're vegan and you're not going to promote mm -hmm. a meat product. Um, but if I'm just like, okay, <laughs> and I don't ask you why, <laughs> then I'm not really doing my job properly. Mm. Or it could be that, you know, you've actually just worked double shifts all week and you could not find the time to do the tape. I also need to know that because mm -hmm. I need to be able to work with you and support you and go, okay, I'll ask for an extension on this tape for you. Or let me hold off on submissions for you for a week or two until you find your feet again. So if the agent also doesn't seem interested in, in why you are present or not present, then it's worth reaching out. Mm -hmm. I think if as a client you've communicated clearly what you want your focus to be and you're constantly being made or asked to audition for things that you don't want to do and made to this is the key not not about being asked to do jobs that you maybe haven't thought about before but if you're made to feel bad for turning something down that you were clear is not your focus that's also I wouldn't say a good thing because that's why yeah. you get to know your clients and they say this is for me this isn't for me there will be opportunities where we go you know what you said you don't want to do commercials but this is actually being directed by so-and-so director and it pays 10 grand and we think it's a really good opportunity for you. We might have that conversation. Mm -hmm. But if you've said to us, look, 
I I don't kiss anyone on screen. And we're like, you need to kiss someone on screen for 10 grand. I can't believe you're turning 10 grand down. <laughs> and you're like, but I've, I've told you I don't do this. You know, that's also, so just having someone who understands and supports mm -hmm. your morals and your focus. Um, and then making, you know, if you've, again, I, I, it's difficult to say because I'd like to think there's no agents doing this, but, you know, not, not reading contracts properly and stuff. So if you've ended up on a few dodgy jobs, where the circumstances are dodgy and you've you've struggled either on set or afterwards for your pay and all that kind of stuff and the contract has bound you where there's nothing the agent can do that's also a red flag now keep in mind the agent can read the contract it can be a good contract and things can still go wrong but then it's the agent's responsibility to reach out to production and try and resolve that yeah. and we're not always able to you resolve it you know in the ideal way because we still have to work with production with casting we have to get them to work with us but ultimately there are standards there are industry standards that they need to abide by and if your agent isn't fighting for that you know isn't chasing the extra usage they've done without paying you or isn't speaking to production about the fact that you were injured on set and nobody did anything about it or you know, if someone's being asked to work 10 days in a row, but the contract says they're only required to work seven days in a row, then the agent making sure that they're either given back time or compensated or telling the client they have the, the right to refuse, you know, working 10 days in a row because that's not in the contract, all those kinds of things. Um, your agent has to be willing to fight for those kinds of things mm -hmm. for you. And again, if they're not, if they're just telling you to brush it off, you know, and are not addressing those things, then that's mm. a red flag. I've heard, I've heard about some cases when, like, when uh, when actors were uh, basically made feel bad mm. for not kind of like going, like doing some casting, or actually sent to the casting that they're very clearly said like that's not what I want to do. I can't mm. even do that. Mm. <laughs> I can't do ballet, for example, or something mm. like that. Yeah, so, of course. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I've heard about things like that. Is there anything that actors can do apart from general just do some training, mm -hmm. you know, don't, you know, don't get rusty. Yeah. Work on your addiction, mm. uh, uh, like that kind of stuff. Apart from that, what can actors do to be more, I don't know, seen to, to raise their kind of chances of being seen by casting directors, uh, is, should we try to reach out casting directors directly? Yeah. Or like other cases where we should and the cases where we definitely shouldn't. Mm -hmm. In general, reach out when you have something specific to show or say. So sometimes you've just had new headshots done mm -hmm. or you have a brilliant new showreel or you've just been in a feature film that's released and you have a nice scene from it. So there's a purpose to emailing. You're not just emailing because... You you want to them to notice you. Mm -hmm. You're emailing them with something notable. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, it's worth maybe every six months or whatever it is doing a general outreach like that. When you're working with an agent, you can look at what you've been submitted for. You can ask your agent for your submissions list or as you know, with our agency, you can see everything mm -hmm. you're being submitted for and say like, hey, you know, who's casting this show? I'd like to reach out to them. And then we can look at the brief or the interactions we've had with our casting director and say to you, they've actually asked for no emails from actors or yes, we know them, they're lovely, please do reach out or let's do joint, you know, um, a joint outreach where mm. you email them and CC us in or we email on your behalf and CC you in or whatever it is, you know, I think again, it comes down to, to working well with your agent. And if you don't have an agent being just very specific about your outreach and not just flooding their inbox all the time, um, you know, they don't want to every single week be opening an email from an actor who's just like, Hey, just updating you that I did a class this week can we grab a coffee and you know as as much as cast and directors would love to connect with actors as they you know they're too busy mm. to to respond to every outreach like that so mm. just make sure it's specific and valuable and um that you also that it doesn't seem like you've just cc'd every casting director in the uk into your email you know that there's a specific reason you're reaching out to that casting mm. director 
you know, you follow them on social media, you like the projects they're working on, or you're suitable for mm. the projects they're working on. There's also no point in, in, I don't know, you're not going to reach out to the SpongeBob musical, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and ask to be cast uh, <laughs> as a, yeah. as a dancer, because that's not your product. So what's the point it in reaching out? <laughs> There's no point in reaching out to that cast and director specifically at that point in time, because they're going to go, oh, cool. Yeah. But, you know, I'm casting SpongeBob at the moment. So. Mm. <sighs> Headshots. Mm. It's a thing that like, I've, 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 I know actors who did like three or four sets of headshots mm. in the, like eight months. Mm. Other rules of like, no, I, I would even say this because first question, like were there cases like on your, like in your experience that actor changed the headshots and then straight away suddenly started to get more? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's very important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it definitely happens where somebody suddenly gets new headshots with the photographers that we've recommended. Yeah. <laughs> and then suddenly they're getting called in more. Again, your headshot doesn't book the job, but it does get your profile clicked on. Mm. Um, there's no rules which makes it difficult that's why actors are always wrestling with the mm -hmm. whole headshot thing but there are preferences and there are things you can do to make your headshots more accessible mm -hmm. personally i need to see life behind the eyes again it's about connecting with that shot mm -hmm. um i want to see what you look like so I don't want you to come meet me in person and look completely different mm -hmm. to what you do in your headshots. Um, I know that's tough because sometimes showing a character you'd want to play and who you are can be different. I mean, you're actors, you're not going to play yourself all the time. But I think it's about alluding to those characters without actually having to dress up as them. So for example, like, I guess, you know, for your general sort of uh, female identifying uh, performer, they tend to have longer hair and do different hairstyles. So if I'm trying to dress for a period piece, then I might do my hair up with, you know, some curls and, you know, a, a lighter color sort of top that mm -hmm. isn't from, you know, the 1800s, but is it's just something that's not necessary, that alludes to that time, right? And then going to um, channel the kind of energy that that character would for that portion of your shoot. Then you can have a portion of the shoot where you're dressed just in your favorite outfit that you would wear when you're meeting your friend for coffee and your hair loose and that's just you and you mm -hmm. do a whole segment of the shoot that's just you and your personality. And then you know, you might want to do one of the blazer on that shows the more sort of lawyer, FBI kind of characters. And then you're channeling those kinds of looks and energies into your picture. So definitely having a set that is your personality, having a set that shows different kinds of characters or different sets that show different characters that you would want to play or can play. And then choosing a selection of those that show mm -hmm. that variation. Are there any trends in, in uh, headshot photography? Like, are they kind of, do, have you noticed, for example, like that something changes in what people want to see mm. in, in headshots or, or in general, there is no such a thing. For example, like outside versus like in studio. Mm. It can be a preference thing because I think every casting director and every agent will have a might have a different opinion on it. Um, there seems to have been a sort of in-studio trend with color on color. Mm -hmm. So like a monochromatic thing going on, which personally I don't like because on spotlight, when your headshot is this small and you have a burgundy top on and a burgundy background, you're just a floating head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then it, that, that color, that dark background saps away any kind of 
brightness we're getting in the face as well. And they sometimes tend to be a bit over edited as well. Mm -hmm. So prefer lighter backgrounds, clothing that then complements your skin and your background. That's also why it's really important to pick a headshot photographer that works well, that you can work well with. Um, because they will guide you in those kinds of things if they are good at what they do. Mm-hmm. You know, they would say, oh, you know, I, that top looks better or I'll match this background with your hair color or whatever it is. And then hopefully chat to you throughout and bring out your personality and have pictures of you laughing and then say, okay, more serious mm-hmm. and you feel more comfortable to put on your serious face without feeling self-conscious mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Um, outside versus inside doesn't really matter. Our natural light is great, but we live in London and it's usually freezing outside. So And everything's grey. And everything's grey. So if you're going to do an outside shoot and you just look freezing for, you know, 90% of your pictures, there's no point in that. No. And you're wearing polar necks that then your headshot is just your mm-hmm. face because you're so cold. No. But <laughs> if it's, you know, if it's summer, you've got natural light, professional setup, why not? In studio works well as long as... I personally prefer lighter backgrounds, obviously still that natural looking lighting, um, not over edited, not too mm. much makeup, um, all that kind of stuff. I prefer something that's a bit more natural. Mm-hmm. Um, the more sort of portrait shots lend themselves more to looking like the back of a book cover, you know, <laughs> this is your novel or, uh, more mod, more modelly. um, and, you know, as an actor, you just want to show what you can do. When we watch something, we believe what we're watching are real people. So your headshots need to reflect a real person, mm. not a model or a author or, you know, so, but you might get agents or casting directors who really like that portrait style. I think for the most part, most of the casting directors I've worked for and then myself working as a casting director and then working with an agent who agrees with me, we prefer to see good quality pictures of a real person. <laughs> you know, everyone's real people, but y- you know what I mean. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. But there are like, there are some uh, photographers that you uh, put for your uh, actors. I know that. I'm just asking just for you to have this information. <laughs> yes. Yes. And you know what? Every agent might have their own kind of list of photographers that they like their clients to mm. shoot with. And I think if you've if you've signed with the right agent and you've committed to trusting that agent, then go with with who they've suggested mm. um, or someone on their list and let them help you narrow down your headshots. As you know, Fiona and I like to help our actors narrow down the headshots because we can choose a variation and look at it from a casting perspective and all those kinds of things. Because ultimately, you need to work with an agent you trust and you need to give that agent a shot. So I know actors can get very much in their heads about their headshots and go, why have they picked that one or whatever it is. Um, But if you consistently feel that your agent is not picking the right photographer photographer for you or the right headshots for you, then that's maybe a like a bigger thing you need to assess as your whole you know, uh, as a whole with your relationship mm-hmm. with your agent or you could say to them hey this person's not on your list i really like this person what do you think and they can give that feedback other agents might let you just you know choose whatever yourself and then you are left with all the information to to cut down but um does it happen that, for example, one photographer is very good for one actor and wouldn't work for another? Or usually photographers are kind of like they just know what they're doing? Yeah, it has happened. I mean, generally, there's one or two that come to mind who I love basically. Every time an actor does headshots with them, I'm like, I love these headshots. Um, and then there's other times where like, there's a photographer Fiona really likes and their headshots come back and you know, it, they work really well for them. And then that's someone else. She recommends it to someone else and they go and I get those headshots back and I'm like, <laughs> I can't do anything with these, mm. you know. Um, so, so yes, it is a trial and error for mm. the actors, definitely. 
I think with certain photographers, actors will feel comfortable enough to bring out what they need in the headshots. And then in other situations, they might not feel comfortable enough. And so then all their headshots look the same or a little bit stiff, um, or they didn't get that feedback they needed on the right backgrounds or the right clothing and that kind of stuff. So sometimes, unfortunately, you can go to a good photographer, but still come out with headshots that don't work for you. Mm. Um, and other times you can have a brilliant shoot and you can use those headshots for a year and then, you know, not have to think about it for a while. So how often do we shoot? Uh, should we, you know, take new headshots? Fiona usually says uh, once a year, which I know is like, ouch. Um, but it, it also depends if after a year, you still look exactly the way you did in your last shoot mm -hmm. and those headshots are still working for you, then keep them. But sometimes you will have changed or you just need to change up which headshots you're using because the casting directors have now seen your face a few times mm -hmm. and it's just nice for them to go, oh, mm -hmm. Andrea's new headshots. Even if it's from the last shoot you did, but you've now just used a different selection. Um, yeah. And then other times you go, you know what, I just need some new ones. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it, you know, check in with your agent. Mm -hmm. Hopefully you have that kind of relationship with them where you can go, I think I might need, it, need new headshots. And honestly, we're not trying to get you to spend money. I'm actually, a lot of the time, I just come to me and they're like, should I do this workshop? Should I do this? And I'm like, no, don't waste your money. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm, I don't want actors to waste money because I know what it feels like to be in mm -hmm. that position. Um, so if you don't need new headshots, we're not going to tell you to get new headshots. It's, mm. it's only if we think it can really benefit you. Mm. Is it worth for actors doing uh, workshops with, ca with casting directors? Yes and no. Okay. Make sure you've, you're picking the right workshops for you. Mm -hmm. So casting directors who are casting the kinds of shows that you would want to be in you can again you can check in with your agent send them the workshop info say do you think this is worth my time casting directors who are not charging an arm and a leg to answer a few questions over zoom i think if you're paying uh, a decent amount of money for a workshop with a casting director it needs to be one where they give you as an individual specific feedback. So you get workshops where you've maybe been asked to prepare a piece, you've taped for them. They're looking at this piece and they're giving you valuable, valuable feedback on, you know, on what you've done. Mm. If it's a Q and A, yes, there's valuable information there, but again, so that kind of information can vary from one casting director to the next. This is the kind of industry where there sometimes isn't one correct answer or one way of thinking. And a lot of the time, I think your agents could probably answer those questions mm -hmm. for you. Um, so then it becomes a curiosity thing. You're curious about what it's like for that casting director to, to work with a certain show. And then it's like, how, it, how beneficial is that information to actually to your career? And how much of it is just your curiosity? And then going, how much am I willing to spend on my curiosity? Mm -hmm. So looking at what the workshop is, what the value is that you're going to get back out of it and what you are willing to spend on that. Because if it's 200 pounds for an hour Zoom, you're not guaranteed to walk away with as much information as you would like. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's, you know, a hundred pounds for a workshop where your tapes have been reviewed, you've been given valuable feedback, that casting director's actually seen your face and knows who you are. There's someone who you can then reach out to again afterwards and say, hi, I did your workshop for this and this. I see you're casting this role that I could be perfect for. Then it's probably value for money. Mm -hmm. I have been in workshops where I'm on, not as an actor, where I'm working in the casting side of things and thought to myself, I don't feel, I've watched it and, and thought, I don't feel that actor got what they were looking for out of the workshop. And of course, you, you can never satisfy everyone. But 
where I can see what the actor was after and knew that they weren't getting that. Or where I, as the assistant, was typing up the feedback um, and <laughs> the feedback they were getting was not actually from the casting director. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, still feedback, but... <laughs> it's still feedback, but I think some people would be very upset yeah. if they knew, well, I've, you know, I've of just course. spent this much money and... Yeah. Look, and I'm sure most casting directors don't operate that way, mm. but you want that proper interaction because... I have also been in situations where people have done workshops with a casting director and they haven't necessarily, you know, the feedback has been, yeah, that was a great tape. And I'm like, that's not helpful. (laughs) But then because they've met that person face to face, when we were casting other projects, they say to me, who's that actor who was in the Zoom the other day? Yeah, I really liked her face and the way she interacted with me. Let's call her in for this. Mm. But that can, do you want to be spending couple hundred pounds in case that happens yeah if you have it fine but if you don't and you need to be more selective then just make sure that it's going to be valuable for you Mm. uh what was your happiest thing that happened while you're working as a as a agent uh i mean (laughs) i don't know if i can pin it down to one Definitely when clients are booking like their dream jobs. Mm -hmm. So we had someone who sort of when they were younger was part of the National Youth Theatre and just always dreamed of being on on the national stage. And then that happened. And we recently had someone whose dream job was to be in Phantom of the Opera and they were just offered a role in Phantom. Um, So, yeah, just definitely, Mm -hmm. you know, seeing people land their dream jobs. Yeah. (laughs) It's not like one massive moment. I, yeah. It's it's the general reward of of really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm guessing like, I'm guessing that's not the easiest job. And no, uh, in when, general, like yeah. I think maybe you you need some kind of emotional feedback from that for sure. Right, right. Yeah, we do we do this job because it's um, valuable and and rewarding to us to mm-hmm. see other people's dreams come true yeah, basically yeah. or to to make sure that other people are working in the industry they want to be absolutely mm. i can i mean this is not a, a negative or a bad reflection on anything i can definitely tell you there's other boring sort of low requirements jobs i could do from nine to five that would just give me a paycheck a higher mm-hmm. paycheck and that would be it i go to my job i get paid a little bit more mm-hmm. and live my life but i choose to do this because i want to help actors Mm -hmm. you know get their dream jobs i want i want actors to have agents who care about them and the industry as much as fiona and i do Mm -hmm. um and i feel that i understand uh performing from a lot of different points of view and aspects and that they I bring value to to my role as an agent and that Fiona does as well. So we're passionate about it. Um, it makes sense for us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes. It, it's it's about the, un- the intangible reward of the job. It's not about pushing for money. We're not, mm-hmm. no, no one on our books is, we're not pushing. Of course, we, we want to make them money and we want to make money. It's always an aspect and everything. I mean, even if people job. prepare, it's, <laughs> even if people pretend it's not. But that's not our driving factor. That's not why we do it, because then we could do any other job mm. for the same amount or more money. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, what's next for you with music? Uh, you know, maybe some EP coming or something. Yeah, yeah, I'm working on an EP at the moment. Um, and then it, obviously I'm quite busy, so I'm not sort of pursuing it full out. I, I really don't have the time. But, you know, as gigs come in and get off it, I'll take them. Um, I'm just singing at sort of some of the local bars and things as you know, there's sometimes jams or just sessions where hosted by other musicians I know that might invite me to sing at or be a part of and um yeah one or two sort of projects on the side that i can't mention yet 
but it's not it at the moment it's a creative expression for me it's a personal project it, it's not like i'm trying to make a career out of music because i already have a career mm. Mm. <laughs> um it's just as you said i am a creative i'm not just an agent so it's good for me to have that outlet mm. and i'm sure that if it wasn't music it would be something else uh as long as i have an a creative project that i'm working on so yeah ep slowly you know releasing one song at a time i say releasing at the moment i'm just putting it on my my instagram um and maybe i'll do something more with it later but just yeah. just creating basically yeah. and then taking the opportunities that occur naturally from that is instagram the only place where uh, people could hear you your music or are there like any other like do maybe you're like on some somewhere on spotify or like Mixed i haven't Clubs put or... anything online yet mm -hmm. uh in, like on youtube or spotify it's just on my instagram for now mm -hmm. Um, which I'm keeping completely separate from my agency and casting work. It, I just had my profile with everything mixed in, which I've recently deleted everything to do with like casting and mm -hmm. some of my personal stuff. And it's just my music page. And once, once I have collected all the materials from the castings and stuff I've done, I might create a separate page for that. Because what I found was a lot of actors were then following, trying to follow me on Instagram. Um, and but everything I'm posting is about music mm -hmm. and they're not following me for that reason um and my profile is still private at the moment because i'm avoiding you know those people who spam your inboxes with like do you want to promote our product and all mm. that kind of i'm just not really social media is incredibly overwhelming for me <laughs> um but eventually i will have a page up with my casting projects with some of the agency stuff and that'll be completely separate it's my music but for now anyone who's interested in my music is welcome to follow me on instagram and my music is available on there and the gigs I'm doing all these will always be posted on there. So, Blitz round. Oh God, okay. <laughs> short uh, questions, short answers. Yeah. Well, I'll try. I mean, you can expand if you want. <laughs> and it's like, it, it, it's not on points. You don't have to like, you don't have to know something to answer. It's just like about you and okay. your preferences. Oh, yeah. okay, uh, me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, you. <laughs> As a person. Okay. <laughs> You're interested. I am a person, I think. <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> All right. Ready? Yeah. Texting or talking? Talking. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Uh, your one guilty pleasure? Fantasy novels. Mm -hmm. Your favorite authors? Uh, I can't give a one a, co a quick answer to that. <laughs> uh, Philip, Philip Pullman. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what makes you laugh? So many things. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> what makes you angry? People who are disrespectful to each other. Do you have any nicknames? Nicknames? Um, my mom calls me Nikki, no. but I don't really like anyone else calling me Nikki. I have a few family members who do, mm -hmm. but when other people do, I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what did you do cook best? Strangely enough, uh, pasta and like different pasta recipes because my mom's side was uh, Sicilian and my nonna used to make Italian food, but I am gluten intolerant. I get mm -hmm. very sick, so I can't even, you know, I'm a, kind of like a traitor to my own people. I also can't really do lactose, so lasagnas mm -hmm. and things are out of the mm -hmm. picture. But what I've become really good at is making dairy-free, gluten-free alternatives to those foods. Mm -hmm. So cooking and baking, in a gluten-free and lactose-free way is... That's a niche. Yeah. It's a separate niche. And I it think is. it's hard. It is hard, but I've had a lot of practice. Uh, your favorite character in any fictional story, like book, screen, or video game? I mean, everyone loves Moira Rose <laughs> from Schitt's Creek. So that's definitely one of them. Okay. Uh, Star Wars or The Lord of the Rings? Lord of the Rings. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do you have any unknown or unexpected talents? I used to, I, I don't do it anymore, but I used to be really good at like martial arts and MMA. Mm. Yeah. And really? people, I say that because it was unexpected. People would be like, what? You did MMA? Mm. Um, but yeah, but I haven't, I don't do it anymore, but I used to be good at it. Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, how often do you cry? It depends. <laughs> I, there's definitely like one week a month where I'm a lot more emotional <laughs> than, than the rest of the month. Twice a month, 
is a healthy amount to admit to. I think so, yeah. I think twice a week might be from time to time. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the very last thing. I asked you yesterday to mm. prepare one cool thing. Mm. Something that you like and mm. you think our viewers should try it too. Yes. And I couldn't decide on one. As you can tell, I'm not very good at short, decisive answers. <laughs> I have two things, if that's okay. Okay. Yeah. They are, in a way, sort of plugs, but they are really cool things. So, um, the one is called Keza Wellness. So, it is a wellness company <laughs> run by a woman named Karen, who is extremely qualified in so many different aspects but the main focus is staying um is movement and staying functional for your everyday person so it's not your typical sort of like fitness website mm -hmm. it's like you are a person who commutes and then sits at your desk job all day and then goes to cook and buys the groceries and all these things so all the workouts are about functional movement about staying um keeping your body, you know, moving, but not about, it's not like you're only doing it to lose weight or you're only mm -hmm. doing it to get strong or whatever it is. So I personally, when I lived in South Africa, I was very active and I, I you know, I worked, actually taught at a gym and went hiking a lot and all those things. And when I moved to London, my lifestyle changed. And so sometimes getting back into like physical fitness can be really daunting when you're comparing yourself and how you've regressed and all these things. And I found Keza Wellness to be so helpful in the sense that it's so accessible. Yeah. I'm going, okay, what can I manage today? Anything between five to 15 to 30 minutes. And it's movements that I can handle. That's not going to put me off from doing exercise the next day. And it's focused on releasing the tension in my neck because I've been sitting at the desk all day or you know, releasing the tension in my hips because I've been commuting for an hour and all that kind of stuff. And Karen is so highly qualified in uh, rehab exercise, reformer Pilates, dance. She was an actress herself, or she is an actress herself. She's a dancer herself. So she knows how to work with performers. So yeah, Keza Wellness, check it out. There's so mm -hmm. many aspects involved that are just beneficial to actors. And I bring it up specifically on this podcast because actors need their bodies to be clay <laughs> and they need to go into a room and feel relaxed enough to become anything and i think because our lives are very stressful we carry a lot of residual tension and if we carry this tension with us into an audition into a room it always underlies rather than us feeling free to just be the character so if we can find a physical movement style that helps us release that tension. I think that's so valuable to an actor. So that's why I've chosen to mention Keza Wellness. Second cool thing, and I'll try and be as quick as possible. Um, no <laughs> um, a music producer named Reese Ruffley, he's producing my EP. But I know there's a lot of actors who are creating their own work and they might want an original score for their short films or for a play they're doing and they're writing their music but they don't know how to turn what they've written into something more so if if you as an actor were creating your own work and you have basic songs that you've written reese could arrange them he could turn them into basically you know full scale song or soundtrack so yeah i just thought that was also valuable for people who are creating their own work and mm. he's just incredible i trust him 100%. He just knows what he's doing, has loads of experience. Um, so, yeah, Reese Ruffley. Nice. Music producer. <laughs> oh, look, we finished just like in time. I've never when, when the well, <laughs> they off. were like, that's <laughs> enough. That's look, thank you so much. It was very nice to talk to you. I, I've learned a lot of new things. Hopefully, I'll be a better actor from now on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and you communicate to your agent. Be careful. Read instructions. And you, you'll have to pay some money for, for new hatches from time to time. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye, guys. <laughs>